Are you ready for season two of Discography? I'm your host, Mark with a C, and Discography is a show where we look at a great artist through the lens of only their canon albums of first release material to see who they really are and how it all stacks up. And you should know that for season two, we will be discussing the albums by the one, the only, Janet Jackson. Singer, songwriter, dancer, actress, a household name, one of the biggest stars the Western world has ever known, and though she sold over 100 million records worldwide, few have really poured through her canonical albums to see how they stack up. From her unsung early recordings to the genre-defining albums Rhythm Nation and Velvet Rope, all the way to 2015's Unbreakable, we're taking the deepest dive into Janet Jackson's studio records one can possibly imagine. Season 2 of Discography premieres on July 17th, 2018 only on Consequence Podcast Network. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Wherever you're listening from today, hit that subscribe button right now. And if it's a place where you can leave a rating or a review, do that as well. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest is Will Butler of the band Arcade Fire. While on tour behind Arcade Fire's Everything Now, Will has been going out before or after some shows in select markets and doing what he calls Disco Town Halls to talk about Election 2018. He and I got into the ins and outs of why and how he started doing this and what he's trying to accomplish. We also get to talk a little bit about his plans for another solo record and what happens after Arcade Fire wraps up this tour. It's Kyle Meredith with Will Butler of Arcade Fire. Let's start with the Disco Town Hall. Mm-hmm. Uh, the concept behind this? I mean, we've always, Arcade Fire has always been a very community-oriented band. We literally had four songs called Neighborhood, mm-hmm. our first record. And we, we did some campaign events for Obama in the primaries in 08 and played the inauguration, played the staff ball, which was fun because it was all the kids that had worked on the campaign, which mm-hmm. is amazing. But ne- never, like, partisan politically or anything. But last year, I took a year, I went to the Harvard Kennedy School, I have a one-year mid-career program. I'm mm-hmm. in my mid-career. Look at you. Uh, <laughs> and I got a master's in public administration. It's like a public policy degree, essentially. Wow. Starting in the fall of 2016, which is an interesting time to be studying right. what is wrong and how to fix it. And, I mean, the other piece is that our, our band for a long time has worked with this group Partners in Health, who started 30, 35 years ago in, the, in rural Haiti, mm-hmm. providing AIDS and tuberculosis medicine, but kind of full, full medical care. And they're very rigorous intellectually and morally, and they're a a really powerful rights organization. I mean, kind of they're, they've sadly had to prove time and time again that medicine works the same on poor people as rich people. It's like, actually, if you give AIDS (laughs) medicine to patients in rural Haiti, it works the same as on patients in Boston. And for a number of years, they had better treatment outcomes than in Boston. Mm -hmm. And they also would have, they, they, they have a, a company tour system. It's like a community health worker system where it's local people going from door to door, making sure people are taking their medicines, making sure that they're healthy, that they're paid. These aren't volunteers. They're paid because it's a job. <laughs> people should be paid. Mm-hmm. And they would, like, write prescriptions for it needs a new roof because they would sell their medicine to, like, put a roof over their kids' heads. So, so it's wow. my politics has been very much informed by working with those guys, with Partners in Health. Yeah. But, yeah, so I went, I went to school in the fall, and Trump won the election, and it was, it was super bad and weird. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, it never feels right to hear it or say it. Still, no. It just doesn't. But yeah, I was, I was literally at the time, I was taking class with this woman, um, Leah wright Rigger, who's a professor at Harvard, young historian. She wrote a book called The Loneliness of the Black Republican. And everyone was like, oh, is that about you? She's like, it's not a memoir. <laughs> it's a history <laughs> book. <laughs> uh, but but her, her course was essentially race in America. Uh-huh. And the last two weeks, the second to last week was talking about Hillary Clinton, and the last week was talking about Trump. That was like on the syllabus. Mm-hmm. And the first weeks we read the, you know, we read the riot report on the 1919 Chicago riots. And that was like one of the through lines. We read the 19 report on the 1919 Chicago riots. We read the Kerner report after the riots in 68. We read the, the Department of Justice report after Ferguson and after Baltimore and kind of like just us doing the same stuff over and over again. And people of goodwill correctly diagnosing the problem for over 100 years and it just being the same racist BS 
and then at the end of this course, Trump got elected. Yeah. And like, oh. And and yesterday, I mean, Chicago's again facing it's smaller riots. Yeah. But, but you know, we're, we're you know over. Yeah. I think about that a lot about the history segment. I'm sorry to interrupt there. Yeah, yeah. Because it's um you know the the old line history repeats you know doomed to repeat it or whatever. But uh but it is it's like it's not like we're talking thousands of years ago, even hundreds yeah. of years ago. Usually, you know, we're even the election itself. You know, yeah. Hillary Clinton got more votes. Yeah. We, we we say that more people want this than that. Yeah. But but enough people didn't come out to vote. You yeah. know, and, th- and that's our, and it's like we just did that. Yeah. We did that a- 18 years ago, you know? It's like, yeah. Ew. Anyway. Yeah. No, so I, so I, that was one of the courses. And and then another course I took with this guy named Robert Putnam, who wrote a book called Bowling Alone, which is kind of like the death of civil society in America. And he very rigorously kind of shows the death of civil society in America. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the question is, like, how do you fix that? Like, how do you connect people? How do you make make society function? Because to the extent that it doesn't function... It, to the extent that society doesn't function, rich people will always be fine, and poor people and marginalized people will always be hurt. And I'm a rich person, so uh, me and my family will probably be fine. But as we dissolve, we're, and we're seeing it now, we're seeing how we're treating immigrants and how we're treating people of color. And, and so you want to figure out how to not just like stop that dissolution of the bonds, but how do you build something positive? And we've done it in the past. And normally when we've done it in the past, we've done it at the expense of black people. <laughs> like we've done the progressive era mm. and, we've, and we've done the New Deal, which aspects of which are amazing. And like we have public schools because of it. And we have, you know, we have social security, but we've always kind of done it at the expense of this other. And that other has generally been black people. Right. And so, but there is some hope in me that we've done it before and we can do it again. And in my darkest moment, I'm like, at least maybe it can be a different other. <laughs> Right, <laughs> but not being the like evil like timeline. May it not the, be yeah. immigrants or black people this time. May it be a. I don't. But in my moments of hope, it's like maybe we can do it better. Yeah. And and so I took all these courses, and then we we went on tour. I graduated in May. We went day after I graduated. Literally, I flew to Barcelona to start a tour in Europe. But then we have all these dates in America. We're going literally to every single major city in America, and we'll have. Eight to seventeen thousand people in a room, and so what do you do if you have eight to seventeen thousand people in a room who are mostly local? You have eight to seventeen thousand locals in a room. That is a wild resource. Yeah. And what do you do with that? And I mean, I'm an artist, and I think art is meaningful, and I think pure art is very meaningful, and I think you can be Emily Dickinson and like sit in a room by yourself and pr- produce things of great meaning for the world. But we happen to do stuff out in public, and we happen to name our songs neighborhood, and we happen to write our music trying to ground in in our communities so, so what do you do with with thousands of people in a room and to me trying to do politics on that level it's pretty easy to to have it approach fascism <laughs> <laughs> because it's just it's just raw emotion and it's a group of people and they bond together and we shouldn't be scared of that when it's when it's when you're being just and true but kind of want to stay away from fascism <laughs> to the extent that you can so I, I decided to put together after parties mm-hmm. so it's like we've just had this aesthetic experience i just played wake up we all sang it together we were all in this room we had this moment i know that you're thinking about the stuff that's going down right now mm-hmm. i know you're thinking about the election i know you're thinking about what you what can you do i know you're thinking about i know you feel a little lost because i feel a little lost so let's all go to a place together and talk about some local things in your community that are happening and so I, the structure of, the, of those disco town halls is, is, is we'd have be an after party at a local venue, normally local promoters who are engaged in their communities. Mm-hmm. We did one in Tampa, for instance. I went, I played Stand By Me, and then I introduced all these organizers who were working on getting people who had been in prison the right to vote. Like, th- there's crazy felon disenfranchisement in Florida and throughout the South. I think it's five million and it's something like 30% of all adult black men are disenfranchised in Florida because of being arrested yeah. on a felony charge. Yeah. We had, so I introduced these organizers who were working on, a, on introducing an uh, amendment to the state constitution of Florida to allow most felons to easily get their voting rights back, like have, it up, have it, most of it be automatic and then have some people apply. I mean, I'm a bit of a radical. I think you should be able to vote from prison. That's how we do it in right. Maine. Like, I'm a Yankee. <laughs> That's how we do it in Maine and Vermont. But, you know, baby steps. So uh, they're like, if you're a rapist, you can't vote anymore. But everyone else can vote, essentially. And they were and they're working on it. And they, they came out and told their stories. 
And then every single person in that room registered to vote, and a bunch of them signed up to volunteer. And it was like a really beautiful moment yeah. in Tampa. Right. And I was there for a night, but I f it was beautiful for me as well. And then in my in my hometown in New York, we played Madison Square Garden, and then we went to a jazz club that our saxophone player Stuart plays at all the time, and we had my city councilman come out and uh, an organization called the Catal Center that's working on closing Rikers Island Jail, mm -hmm. which is it's it's the jail, so it's people that haven't been convicted yet. It's all pre-trial detention, mm -hmm. and. The numbers are absurd where people have been held p before trial for years. And some of that is improving because of pressure like this. And, and there's a bunch of people working to close it, which I support because I do think that places and names become poisonous yeah. and, and whole systems become poisonous. And you essentially have to abolish them and start afresh because right. it's it is things become cursed. And it's not like some mystical curse. It's like humans curse a place and then... And any guard on Rikers Island knows they're a guard on Rikers Island. They're and part of that story. And they... Yeah, and continuing it, that. And it just happens. Right. It perpetuates, and it's a place of violence and despair. And so we did one on closing Rikers Island uh, prison, jail. And so I did 10 or 12 of those in the last tour. And then... So now we're going back through America again for two weeks. I actually have my son on this tour, so I was like, oh, I'm not going to do anything. I've got my six-year-old. It's going to be, like, so bananas. But I read the news. We all, yeah. maybe I guess we don't all read the news, but a lot of us read the news these days. And it's, I was like, okay, fine. Got to do something. Like. Well, especially, uh, I appreciate it, because in Kentucky, yeah. we've got Mitch McConnell. Oh. We've got this horrible governor yeah. that's just the biggest Trump fan in the world, you know. <laughs> and we're not exactly used to that. And this is what happens when people don't vote. I thought the same way. I was like, well, there's no chance that guy's going to get it. You know, yeah. and I took my son. We do the voting every time. He goes with me. He really enjoys that. And, um, and then, of course, the bad news the next day. Um, so for you to come here using the podium, and even if half the time you're speaking to the choir, yeah, you're still inspiring them. Yeah, and I think speaking to the choir is incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think getting people who kind of read the news and are like, I'm on your team, getting them to actually act is great. If you can right. get 5% of the people to actually go out and knock doors for a candidate, that's amazing. Right. Like, radicalizing the choir is a good thing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like a straight white dude that's probably very centrist deep in my core, but the radicals are really pushing things in a good direction, I mm -hmm. think. I think if we're ever going to get health care in this country, it's going to get people that I, who I think are probably going too far <laughs> to get it to happen, mm -hmm. and then we'll have it, and then it'll be great. So I, I'm trying to, yeah, trying to radicalize the choir, I think, is a, is a worthy goal. And I also think it's, like, as an artist, when you support candidates or you support organizations you you do bring relief to them mm. to the people where it's like oh i'm i'm a candidate for state legislature in kentucky but a rock band cares about me like when a fan comes to me and says i like you i feel great for a day right so when a band comes and says i like you it does it gives you momentum it mm. like makes you real feel like you're you're doing something and I, and I used to think that was that really wasn't important and the more i've done this sort of work and the more i've lived i realized that like being secondary support to the people on the ground is is really valuable for a person in my position right. for the people that are in the places more of us need to be first line responders like more of us need to be me be talking to our neighbors and out on the streets when things go down but there is a there is there are levels well i certainly appreciate what you're doing i like the the position you come from too because you know american uh the ties with haiti the ties with canada you know it's you're an international band, and I'm, I'm sure you get to see things that a lot of people don't, and they're not privy to, and to kind of bring those conversations yeah. to people that never leave their hometown, you know? Yeah. It's Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to tie that in the, mo uh, the music, though, because, you know, it, it, it's, it's usually there. You know, I, I was looking at your solo record with a song like Anna, you know, and that repeating line of money, yeah. money, you know, over and over and over. And, and there's the question you ask at the end of the song, what was that? Uh, I can't remember right Neither now. Neither can I. I, I the whole song. No. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it, it's just saying, you know, like, in, in, you know, what are you going to do when that's, yeah. you, know, it, 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 you know, because I feel like it's impossible to get, well, you can't get the money out of politics as much as we want it to, yeah. you know, not right now. Yeah. Not right now. It's not going to happen. But to, to, to ask that question, to kind of push that forward. I mean, I'm, I'm down with capitalism as long as it's an accurate social science, mm -hmm. but the part where it becomes a value system, it's so harmful and we're seeing the fruits of that where we have like a big idiot rich buffoon mm -hmm. who's like whose first thing he tells Theresa may is you should sue it's crazy it's just the UN. crazy it's like sue what is that and that's 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 where you start with him no that's i mean you need like you need something to be a value system and 
and I, you know, it's hard. We're, that's part of the struggle in our society right now is like trying to construct a value system that isn't like money good. Because that's all we've heard for the last, since right. like 1979, right. basically, is right. that like money good, like capitalism wins, like capitalism wins. And you're like, no, capitalism is fine insofar as it's like a measurable economic system, but like get it, get it out of my face otherwise. Right. Like there, it's about your neighbors and about humans. And that was that's the experience of partners in health is is they talk a lot about human rights, but they talk about that because the missing aspect is is rich people not seeing other people as humans. Mm-hmm. Like if you just see people as human, then you give them health care, right. then you help them, then you get them a house. So that's the part. That's why it's a human right is because it's it's just that it's like oh those are poor people in Lima, Peru. Like they whatever they're not human, and it it's literally as simple as that. But you know getting people that there's there's feedback loops as to how you actually get people to like wake the hell up and and realize and treat other people as human and since we're in a democracy when our government treats people like humans it is an expression of us and it's a feedback loop and we start to identify as treating people as human i think and i think there's real power in having a representative government and having it and having it do the right thing and then that I think you get into cycles where stuff becomes better. It, sometimes it takes 40 years. Sometimes it takes, I mean, who knows? So yeah. you, you have good days and bad days. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that's the most perfectly said thing. If you can just get these people in power to see people as humans, as not, well, let's just separate them and put them in cages. Yeah. Because you don't, because you never see them because they're not real. They're, 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 a, they're, a, they're a political token that and, you can gamble with. And I don't, I don't want it to sound soft, the seeing other people as human. Because oftentimes the way you get to see people as human is you get them the health care first. Mm. And then since you're giving them that, they are human to you all of a right. sudden. Like you can't just be like, we need to focus on love first. But I, I, I'm a, once again, I'm an artist. Mm. I'm a musician. Mm. I'm kind of a Christian. <laughs> I'm a weird heretical Christian. But I do believe that. But it, it's not a soft thing. It's a very hard, how do you provide concrete goods to people? Because that is that is the pudding. Right. <laughs> that is the pudding. Eat it. <laughs> so I want to ask some, some stuff about the music, too, uh, specifically. Um, now that you'll soon be in the middle of an Arcade Fire album cycle, because I'm sure you're probably coming to the, the end of the Everything yeah. Now cycle, uh, are you looking to do any more solo records? Because we loved the last one so oh, much you know you. we played a lot of take my side we played anna a lot so oh thank you I, I don't know if that's in your plans if that's something now that you'll because i guess when you do that you sort of never get to turn off either so i don't know how important it is to yeah in a, in a dream world i'd have a in a dream world i'd have a record out next year but it it takes so long to physically manufacture the record that it it might be the year after but uh, yeah it's definitely definitely in the works it seems like this would be the stuff that you would be singing about once again yeah <laughs> you know when you do take my side and i was thinking about the uh with pete Seeger, uh uh which side are you on yeah. which johnny defranco just did a really great new version of oh, that cool. I'm like oh man it's like an updated version of that almost <laughs> it's like a, of course when you play it next to stand by me it yeah. means also something completely different to yeah. me so i would uh I, I, i'm really looking forward to what you do with all of this oh thank you artistically and musically and the arcade fire record with everything now you know, when I thought about it in the context of what you were doing today, I thought, here's a record that I wouldn't call a political album, nor would I call any of your records political records, yeah. but the culture, the environment, the atmosphere that led to this current state that we're in. Am I close when I'm sort of trying to put it all in a, in a bubble, in a box, and say this is what this record is? Because that's what I feel like we're talking about. You know, the everything now idea is, is um, and I, it just that title alone, those two words right there. It's like, you know, this this is the culture that we live in. Yeah. This is the guy who's in the White House. Yeah. And it's utterly overwhelming where it's it's the most horrifying news in the world. And then also like stupid news about North Korea. There's like terrifying news about North Korea and there's stupid news about North Korea. And there's horrifying news about how we're treating people. And there's the World Cup. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> there's... Do you remember the balloon? And there's a hilarious joke. Like U2's then, Zuropa yeah. tour. Like, this is what it feels like. Yeah. You know, those TVs that's just nonstop. Yeah. Like, oh. I mean, that's how I feel from 8 to 11 p.m. every night when I'm, like, accidentally looking at Twitter on right. the phone. Right, right. But, no, I, we, the way we always make albums is we go home and we live our lives and we try to plug into where we live and we try to let it emerge organically from that. And that's, once again, there's other ways of doing art and there's other ways of making political art, but ours has very much been grounded in 
living as humans in specific places and bringing that to the work. The flip side of being an, a very successful artist is you also become a target every single time. Yeah. It, because it's always, no matter what you do, you're sort of a target somehow because you're huge. Yeah. You too is a grand example of that. It doesn't <laughs> matter what they do, they're always going to be a target yeah. now. Did it feel like it was more for this record? Like there was more somehow louder opposing chatter? Yeah, definitely. I mean, partly it's that we're bigger. Partly it's, part of it is genuine response to the record, which is super fine. Part of it was the album launch, and then the people that were reviewing the album tend to be people who are more online and then were really exposed to the album launch in a way that I don't think the average listener was. Right. So they approached it with baggage, which baggage that we created, so it's kind of our fault, but it, <laughs> it was different. No, I mean, it's also fifth record. It's a long career. Bruce Springsteen actually told us once, just like, make sure that you can always play shows in Spain because there will come a time when people hate you for like a decade and you can just disappear and go play shows in Spain where people love you <laughs> and you'll be in Spain <laughs> and you can eat delicious food and then 10 years after people will realize that you're really great and then you go back you then go back to America. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's so great to have that kind of uh, mentorship in a way, I, I guess, because... No, it's wild that, like that Bruce Springsteen told us that. You're like, yeah. Oh, that's great. Because <laughs> we see, as we look back historically at, at yeah. musicians' arcs and everything... That you sort of that everybody deals with that. If you've had a, if you have a long enough successful career, like there was even a time when people were mad at Neil Young more. You yeah. know, you know and those eighties years they weren't kind to him. And David Bowie went through a very fallow period that people that he has like talked about online and mm -hmm. been like that was a silly record. And then the end of his life like put out the most the masterpiece and brutal <laughs> statement on his whole life. Yeah. It was stunning. And then he died. Yeah. And it was and it like. What a capstone! And while he was and while he was making records that people didn't like, he was supporting bands like ours and mm -hmm. supporting all sorts of bands and like playing amazing shows and and like touring with great artists. So he he was always doing very levels of work. I mean, to me, there was never a bigger mythical artist. Yeah. Than David Bowie, the fact that you, <laughs> you know, got that moment with him, those moments, you know, I, I and I remember watching the fashion show. That you got, I remember seeing that a dozen times online yeah. and just watching that and, and just loving you know every bit of it and then and how he ended up on the record. Yeah, I'm um, envy is not the right word because there's nothing for me to be envious about, but right. just like in awe. Yeah, yeah, right of of something like that. I mean, what an interesting life and career that you all get to have. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so the everything now uh, tour it, it eventually comes to a close and you guys kind of go your separate ways for a little bit and, yeah, and as you not, say live your life. Not like super separate like. I, I don't have a place in Montreal anymore. I'm in Brooklyn. But everyone else is tied to Montreal. Winter Regina are in New Orleans more, but that's my brother and sister-in-law, so mm -hmm. I, I'll, <laughs> right. I will be connected to them. Yeah, I bet we'll take a breather and then recharge and start starting a record. Let's see. Sir, keep doing it. Yeah. Well, I love it, man. Right, I thank you. thank you for so much for this, uh, for these town halls. Oh. Really, I think this is important work that you're doing. This thank is, you. And somebody's got to do it. <laughs> People got to do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks so much to Will Butler for that call. The latest Arcade Fire record is called Everything Now. Hey, don't forget you can subscribe to Consequence of Sound's YouTube channel to keep up with your favorite artists and interviews. And for you podcast fans, head over to iTunes, Podchaser, or wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, leave a review and give us a rating. And then head over to WFPK.org. That's where you'll hear me do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern. You'll also find a few bonus episodes of this series over there. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.